Right, so good afternoon everyone and um, hello to everyone here and also everyone on Zoom. Hope you can see and hear us okay and the screen share is working for you. Um, just to let you all know, we will be recording the event. So um, um, anyone virtually, if you could possibly keep yourself muted just to not inter interfere with the sound and um, we will have time for Q&A at the end of the presentation. And so I think there's nothing left for me to do, but to introduce Carl, thank you very much for coming to speak with us this week. I see there's a couple more people just about to walk in, but um, thank you very much. And um, I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Susan. Come on this afternoon, let's wait until Leonard comes to well. Hi. <laughs> Welcome. Thanks for the invitation to the seminar series and thanks for coming here and coming, uh, locking in virtual. A just net zero energy transition for Europe evaluating pathways is the topic of my talk. And I will start with the question, how to fairly distribute the mitigation effort among subsidiary entries. And we use the European Union Green Deal 2030 targets, effort sharing targets as an example here. But second, also the decision is not only whether to do a net zero pathway, but also it matters which one we really implement. And we can look for the distributional implications of different net zero pathways. Thanks, thanks for the next Hi. And here it's the example of all of Europe uh, net energy, net zero energy pathways. So it's two papers. One is with uh, economist Keith Williams, Williges, philosopher Lucas Meyer, um, and uh, system scientist and integrated assessment modelers, Florian Matzek and uh, Ian Riai. The paper is linked to the invitation uh, you received for this event. Second one is common work with both colleagues of mine at Graz University, Jakob Meyer and Katrin Bachner and building upon work of other colleagues in a European Union project called Sustainable Transitions Energy Laboratory. And you'll see some of the results if you're interested in the deliverables on this web page. Some of the co-authors are around as well. He really is not for sure it's uh, Jakob Meyer. So we can also uh, be present in the discussion with you. I introduced both papers here to serve the interest of a broader audience today. Both papers are linked to uh, distribution issues. So sharing the effort of the European Green Deal, I'll start with introducing different equity principles and how to operationalize them. Then how to combine different equity interpretations and we can derive negotiation convergence points report our simulation results and discuss and conclude. The equity principles the IPCC distinguishes are capability, equality, responsibility. Capability means that the greater the ability to pay, the greater the proportion of costs an agent should take in solving the problem. This relies on the idea of positive duties of the most and more advantaged to have those less advantaged and worse off. Equality, various interpretations, we use two of them here. Everyone should be able to enjoy a level of well-being above the one required for basic needs. So it's a sufficiency threshold. First, that should be served, and then the carbon budget is distributed equally among the remaining uh, agents. The second interpretation could be that all countries converge to the same equal per capita emission level at some point in the future. And for responsibility, uh, the most known interpretation would be that states should be responsible for their own emissions, since they have been liable to know about limited absorption capacity of the atmosphere, and we take this to be the year of 1995, second. Um, IPCC report. One could also take other senses. For example, you could even take account of the emissions before that because countries emitted 
in producing infrastructure that we still benefit from today. And this benefit should be equally distributed. So those three different principles, and I'll introduce the indicators we use for that. So the most common for capability is GDP per capita. The European Union has a very special version of it in its 2018 effort sharing regulation directive, where they cut off not above 40%, uh, not below uh, zero. So we use that as a second interpretation. But there is other interpretations, for example, government effectiveness. Um, here we use a combined index taking into account institutional effectiveness, physical infrastructure, human capital, policy stability, efficacy. It's a World Bank index. And fourth, renewable growth capacity. Those countries that did expand renewables in the past may be able to do easier so in the future as well. This was capability. Then let's go to equality. The first interpretation here is again the sufficiency level basic needs. And then beyond once that is served, beyond the carbon budget goes to all countries again. You could also, uh, this, this was the second interpretation, converge to an equal per capita emission level. And you could can do that ever for either for just the emissions beyond ETS, so the effort sharing sector, or for all emissions, that's uh, total emissions, equal per capita. Yeah, and then a very interesting one, responsibility, taking account of historical emissions, so we shift back the date from which on we distribute the available, still available power budget back to 1995 and start from there on, or go even before that, Benefits we still have from capital investment that in its production also created emissions, and we still benefit from that capital. Or we go uh, to carbon budget, that means all the remaining budget between now and 2030 is equally shared, not converging to an equal per capita, but the full budget is equally shared per capita across, uh, across the European Union. Renewables, a different interpretation. We could also say that those countries that have increased renewables in the past have contributed to the common good. And so they need to do less emission reduction in the future. So it's a different interpretation how you could think of renewables. And finally, cumulative emissions. Here we use the actual population counts of the past, not just the current population count, but um, what were really the per capita emissions in the past and, and equally this time. The more you have had in the past, the less you will have in the future. Okay, so this triangle here helps us if we do combine those uh, different principles, choosing one interpretation each. So for example, um, we could increase the weight of equality moving down this um, triangle side here, we could increase the weight of responsibility and we could increase the weight of capability. So if we have a point of A, that means 100% responsibility. If we have a point like B, it's roughly equally weighted all three uh, principles. Now we can take these principles and choose one interpretation for each principle and let the algorithm run through and see what emission reduction target is resulting for each country. If we do that for Germany and choose the first of these interpretations, so um, historical emissions here for responsibility, U per capita, GDP per capita for capability and basic needs for equality. Then depending on which weight we give to each of these principles, Germany gets a certain emission reduction in the year 2030, relative to 2005, 44%, 42%, 40%, etc. So we see that um, the equality principle would ask for least emission reduction of Germany. But if we switch the indicators, so just one indicator, here we switch to the equality to full converging to the same equal per capita, then this for Germany means the strongest emission reduction. 
uh, out of the three prim prim principles, if we weigh that strongest, it's more than 52%. In the commission suggestion last July, the Green Deal, uh, the Germany was asked, was suggested to reduce by 50%. So that's the red line here. So depending on what interpretations we have, we get different reduction targets. Now each country could look around and see, well, what reduction targets do I get when I take which interpretation, which rate? If they do that, they come up with a certain range of emission reduction they might have to do depending on which interpretation you take and which rate you give these. And once we do that, um, and yeah, you can look for your own country for, um, in this shiny app. It's in the paper also linked that we were sent with the invitation to play around with different interpretations and see what countries uh, would have how strong an emission reduction target. Now, those countries now negotiating within the European Union because the European Union is increasing its target. So far, it's 40% uh, and the Green Deal asked for 55% by 2030. There was an effort sharing regulation in 2018 for the old target, so every country knows what it would have had to do by then with the old target. Now they have to increase the target. It could be that each country says, well, we don't want to have don't want to deviate most, we want to deviate least from what we had in the old target. So that would be one way where negotiations could go. Second, um, each country could take a look, well, if I play around with these uh, principles and the interpretations, I find out there's one specific interpretation and weighting where I have to do the least, where I can em emit the most. So this is the upper bound of equity compatible emissions. Countries may also look for that weighting of principles that has least additional effort beyond this upper bound of equity compatible emissions. It's still equity compatible because there is an interpretation of equity where you can say, well, that's, that's okay. And we apply these two um, methods or these two yardsticks to find negotiation points and we do minimal aggregate deviation so we minimize the sum of square of the emission. What do we find? So here you have all the different countries of the European Union and here is the emission reduction target relative to 2005 by 2030 starting from zero up to 100 percent. The black line here is the line of the commission document last July, what the commission proposed, each country should reduce by 2030. And what we see is that if countries follow this minimal deviation to the old effort sharing regulation, it's the blue bars here, plugging in all the different variable, uh, variations of interpretations and weightings across uh, those principles. You find these ranges here. So 50% of them are here, the boxes, and then the whiskers are for the remainder. What we see is that those countries that already have a stricter target with the European Commission proposal tends to be even stricter if we go for that analysis. The European Commission looked at GDP per capita only, basically. If we add responsibility and equality, those countries that have to do a lot have to do even more, and those countries doing least have to do even less. There's two exceptions here, Sweden and Germany, which already did a lot in the past, so equality and responsibility doesn't add further commitment to that. And we can take a look at what are the negotiation points, what weighting would be amongst those uh, principles depending on how you interpret them, we find that for the minimal deviation to the effort sharing regulations, the blue points and the size of points says, if there's more negotiation points in that large, large, larger number, then it's bigger. So most of these points are close to 100% or strong weight of capability, which is not surprising because that's what the EU basically did 
and it derived these uh, targets. But what's interesting is that also if we look for least deviation from the um, upper bound equity compatible emissions, we still get quite a heavy weighting of cap capability. So our result is when in those negotiations you're bound to choose only one principle, it makes very much sense to choose capability and uh, to choose um, GDP per capita, basically. So we have a reason why the EU did so. Okay, so introducing this approach should give you a um, view of a systematic transparency to evaluate national emission reduction efforts according to different equity dimensions. We applied a number of different equity interpretations. It's no end. You can go beyond what we did, but we tried to choose interpretations that have the most broad range here, at least. It's a novel method to assess possible convergence points, acceptable negotiation outcomes. Our results, the GDP per capita based capability approach of the European Union covers well the majority of uh, countries of the EU. But if you add quality and responsibility, this is equally important to consider. And when you introduce it, you get a broader range of the targets. So meaning that those with, which already have high reduction targets from the capability approach only will dimensions of quality and responsibility. And so we think that this approach could lead to more buy-in than the 2021 single indicator-oriented approach, especially for those countries who are not pleased with this GDP per capita. So this was the first distributional concern of this afternoon. And before we come to the q and I take you to the second. Distributional evaluation of net zero pathways. Once we have decided in each of these countries, and now I go beyond the EU, once we have decided in each of these countries to do a net zero pathway, which one should we take? And what are the distributional ones of different options we do have? And here I'll start with taking you to the framework. It's a model coupling framework. Do the comparative evaluation in three steps. I'll start with the narratives, technical energy details, and then the economic evaluation. The results are both on the method side and on the content side. What are the dis how different are the distributional implications on welfare, GDP, employment, public budgets? So the coverage now is all Europe. So it's also including the U27 plus uh, Switzerland. The Switzerland, Norway, UK, and also Southeastern Europe here. And we aggregated to these regions, as you see them in the same, in the same color here, to get more straightforward interpretation of results, not to have 30 different results, but just for these re regions. So what we do, we start out with a narrative generator uh, developed at Jas Potsdam and derive different narratives. One of them is cost-effective. That means least uh, cost from a bottom-up energy model perspective, least cost solution. But then we take it over to the energy model of its Calliope of ETH Zurich and take it one step further. What are the macroeconomic feedback implications if you go for this energy path. And that's a dynamic CG model from us at Graz. So we know that using just a top-down approach, as we have it here, is misleading, especially if you go to very strong emission reduction, if you go to close to net zero emissions. There, we had, we once, uh, run it just with the top-down approach, no, no coupling here, and then emission permit prices raised to unrealistically high prices. 
So it's very relevant to really link these two approaches, bottom-up energy with top-down macroeconomic to the benefit of both. The partial energy model learns what are the macroeconomic feedbacks that they wouldn't see. And uh, the macroeconomic model builds upon the energy sector details and only then gets relevant and meaningful results. So this is our one narrative, cost-effective. And then we're interested in, well, this energy future, it can be more centralized or decentralized. So we use one which we call government directed, which is more centralized uh, energy pathway and people powered narrative, more decentralized and then interpret, Im implement those in the Calliope the energy model and in the economic model. So what do these three uh, narratives mean? All have the similar to the EU Green Deal, all have minus 55% emission, greenhouse gas emission reduction by 2030 and net zero by 2050. And we know that it's mainly an electrification and in electricity it depends on how much is generated and then you can play around with how much is transmitted, how much storage you need. And the cost effective one has only techno-economic limits, no transmission limits and therefore uses relatively low storage. The centralized one has half of the technology centralized, includes still nuclear at the current level, but has a limit transmitting only a maximum 15% of current production and therefore needs medium storage. And the people powered one has 80% decentralized, uh, nuclear phase out and less than 5% transmitted. So it needs most uh, storage. So we'll first look now at this cost effective narrative <coughs> and then use this as a reference and compare the other two to the cost effective. So we want to know our choice going more centralized or decentralized. What are the macroeconomic feedbacks of going more centralized or decentralized? Well, what do I mean with centralized or decentralized? Decentralized are those technologies that in principle could be decentralized, onshore wind, rooftop PV, combined heat and power. And the other ones are centralized, offshore wind, open field PV, conventional power plants. That's the definition is there. So looking back and comparing our cost-effective net zero pathway, looking back, this is uh, historical data of electricity prices. The blue range here is the U27, and then you have single countries like the UK, is the bright blue here, pointed out. Our cost-effective net zero energy pathway gives costs of energy, including generation, storage, and transmission of 80 euro uh, at the price level of 2018 per megawatt hour in 2030, and of 50, so at the lower end, of this past historic range in 2050. So that's also the case, that's one example, but that's also the case for other uh, European countries. So that's the reference point. So electricity prices are not rocketing anywhere, they are still in the range of the past. Now we can compare what happens uh, if we choose either decentralized or centralized. And we measure that, I have one doesn't see the label here, the title fully. So it reads effective levelized cost of energy. That's a result of the energy model. We plug in the various technologies and get um, an energy output that is demanded and can divide it by the costs. So we divide the costs by the amount of energy and get a levelized cost of energy. I call it therefore effective because it's not a technology parameter, it's a system result. The system has certain costs and are these costs divided by the actual demand of energy of, the, of Europe. So what do we see here in the aggregate? Um, uh -huh, they have switched here. Um, so these are um, switched around a little bit. So this 4% should be here, the 10% here. Um, overall in the centralized in the government directed energy costs go up 
who went 10% in 2030 and 2050, also go up in the people powered scenario because we have less transmission. So therefore we need to produce more, store more, etc. So it's more, more expensive. It's no longer cost effective. That's one exemption. In the people powered 2030 version, we have so much cheap PV rooftop that it's actually cheaper. There are a few peculiar countries here, for example, Austria. So why is the uh, cost declining for Austria? Austria has lots of pump, higher hydro pump storage. And as long as we have lots of transmission lines, this is used by everyone in Europe. If we cut down the trans transmission lines, it's basically Austrians using this cheap storage. And even more so if we go to the people parts scenario. And also we have here, Germany and Greece, which have declining costs, basically because they have to introduce less transmission lines. And in 2030, the integration costs of renewables are not high because the market penetration is below, so this less transmission lines is dominant. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, are you assuming that the cost of those technologies is staying the same as no. today? Or is no, it... there is learning by doing, so, so there is dynamics. Okay, the... so you're reusing the learning rates. Yes, yes. Okay. thanks, yeah. Uh, are we talking only about electricity? Yes. Are we talking only about electricity or energy here, in general? Yes. Here it's just, uh, no, it's it's general. It's general, so it's uh, energy, level as cost of energy. Yeah, it's all of energy that's needed. but. We had a strong push, especially in 2050, towards electricity. But it's energy in general. Thanks for clarifying that. Okay, yeah. Uh, when you now talk these energy targets of Europe, does this include also scope free emissions of the countries? This is full. This is full because we have the whole energy system, and whoever needs this energy, all of the sectors. Uh, the full energy only is decarbonized. So it's really net zero in 2015. So also from products we buy from China. That's included. Uh, no, thanks. Uh, it's the demand, just the energy demand within Europe. Yeah. So it's, it's a so net zero. Get cost effectiveness, mm -hmm. maybe to reduce emissions somewhere else. Yeah, it's much start. more cost effective thanks, than we thanks. in yeah. Germany. Yeah. And we look at because yeah. it's a world problem, not the Swiss, German, Thanks. or Austrian mm -hmm. problem. Thanks. Here we take the demand as given from the various sectors, and yeah. then we decarbonize this demand. So it's not a global analysis of cost effectiveness, it's, it's, it's this one within Europe. Which is a little bit cheap. Huh? Well, it's the way that's the action room that Europe has, basically. And we can, of course, protect it by carbon adjustment measures. Yeah, but you okay. can then improve I, your situation uh, by buying critical stuff from China. They put uh, gas definitely, stations, definitely, yeah. charcoal definitely, stations. Yeah. And let's let's keep that. Yeah. Yeah. Let's keep, uh -huh. goes into the other let's keep that for the discussion, because here our focus is more on looking how centralized or decentralized does change the picture, not okay. what basic strategy we have. Your discussion would, would be rather good. For understanding, then I will take it now, otherwise I will shift to the Q&A session. Uh, I just wanted to ask about the story for Spain and Italy, why, why the costs go up so much, but you can leave that yeah. there if you want. Okay. Uh, we come to part of that in a minute, yeah. Mm -hmm. So when we take this cost from the energy model now to the economic model, it's interesting what feedbacks we have. So uh, first we lead you to welfare. And clearly the higher the energy cost, the lower the welfare. But we do have a second aspect here that our results basically showed. The more decentralized or the more we deviate from the cost effective, I have to say it in more general, the more we have uh, capital intensive renewable investment. And that means during the implementation phase, more labor demand, but also it once it's installed, there is a higher capital stock. Higher capital stock, more income, more labor, labor demand. So the second effect is increasing welfare in the long term, also short term. And the first one is decreasing welfare. So it depends on uh, what's stronger. And if we take a look, um, in, this, in these figures, you have here on the horizontal axis, this energy cost from the partial model from Kalaiota. 
increasing or decreasing, and we have well failure. So overall, the higher the cost of energy, the lower is welfare. So we have a downward sloping line here. But in the lower line here, people power 2030 and 50, we see that this line is higher up. The reason being that here, the second effect, higher uh, energy uh, uh, capital investment, higher labor demand is causing that even though we have increasing energy cost, welfare is either less declining, non-declining here, or is even increasing. Now let's look at a few peculiar uh, countries. In the centralized version, France still has its nuclear power, doesn't have to invest that much in transmission lines, etc. So in both cases, France is better off than the average of the EU. And in both cases, and this comes back to your question, we see that the periphery countries have, a, have stronger losses. The reason being that they benefited most of these transmission lines. The transmission lines are cut the more you on the periphery you lose. So you have here the Iberian Peninsula, Southeastern Europe, and also Greece. Um, Northern Europe was the same case here in, in the sen sen centralized way. But in the decentralized, we have an additional effect that um, transmission lines only cut to 5%. That means Greece can no longer export its, uh, its energy, mainly electricity. So shifts to the production to Northern Europe and Italy. That are the reasons. So the production shifts over there. So that's a macroeconomic feedback. It's not in the energy partial model. So translating these, um, we see that welfare overall for the EU27 is declining in 2030 and in 2050, but is increasing in the people powered in 2030 and in 2050. So these numbers should always be a little bit further right here. And we see that it's quite um, a diverse distribution, the per periphery loses most, but in the people powered, um, we have um, less welfare decline because we have the second effect and have even welfare increase, especially for Northern Europe. So these changes in welfare basically translate also, now I come to the next slide, to GDP. That's not the growth rate, that's the impact of GDP. But the range here, so again, both uh, in the sense centralized, it's negative, in the people part, it's positive, but the range is smaller. So the other components of GDP rather than consumption are smaller impacted, so the range is smaller. And these GDP changes also translate to employment, the higher GDP, the higher employment or the, the lower unemployment. Overall in sand centralized version, unemployment is higher in the people power, unemployment is lower. One interesting aspect is the public budget. Yeah? I have a question, but it's linking up to this question. What's happening in France? France? I'm happy, happy for this to be answered. Yeah, later. okay, I'll come to that later. Okay. Okay. So, France basically, well, to answer it right away, had to introduce a lot of transmission lines earlier. Doesn't have to do so now. There are less tra transmission lines and they are more bound to their own energy. That, that's the first reason we found, found out. So going to public budget, so here we have sand centralized 2030, 2050. It's the different elements of budget revenue, commodity taxes, labor taxes, capital taxes, output taxes, trade, export import tariffs, etc., and CO2 permit. So for the centralized one, basically all the revenues go down because GDP goes down, etc. But in 2030, the permits. Why? We have 
uh, now a more expensive renewable transition. So we need higher permits to reach the same fossil target, the same emission reduction target. And that means that in this government directed uh, case scenario, we have a higher revenue. So this even shifts the revenue in the direction had we had a negative impact, now it's a positive one. And reverse is happening in the people power scenario here. The very cheap rooftop PV means that the absolute emissions even go down in 2030. So we have not the full comparison here because emissions are lower. And that means, of course, that the current price is lower. So here, governments lose out on revenue. And that carries over to the GDP components. But GDP, all components, again, private consumption, public consumption investment go down. But for these government, uh, the public con consumption goes up because revenues of permits increase or because revenues of permits decrease. On the EU aggregate, this doesn't change the net effect here, but for some countries it does. And Greece is one of those countries where it does because it really relies on, um, it had, uh, they were mainly paid from abroad, these uh, permits. So, to conclude, um, in methodological terms, we saw that this type of macroeconomic modeling CG has severe limits for the analysis of structural breaks. So it's necessary to couple it with fine-grained bottom-up modeling, particularly for very low emissions. And integrating the macroeconomic feedbacks can inform the energy models again, in the other direction. Results of this coupled modeling we identified different boundary conditions, narratives for net zero energy configurations. Here we analyzed centralized versus decentralized. And this highest partial, partial cost solution, you, you remember, people power was plus 26% or so, but was the highest energy cost in the partial model, turned out with the best welfare results, but very diverse across countries. And this diversity across countries tells us also who might be in favor of what, what direction, or if we implement that in Europe, who should pay for it? Who has the best benefit of it? And being here um, at ILAT, I think it could also be a motivation to find sensitive intervention points because also in the, in the fin fin financial crisis, we couldn't imagine how it would be different. And now there may be a mental block of, we don't know how such a net zero world could look like and therefore we don't start modeling it gives a clearer picture and might raise um, yeah, willingness, awareness of people to go there. So we know this discussion of centralized versus decentralized from the literature. Centralized, large scale, more uh, portfolio standards, decentralized, more feed-in tariffs. But what we use here is the new, the changed picture. Renewables are much cheaper now. So we have to look into this uh, decentralized renewables again and comparing them on along a net zero pathway. Thanks a lot for your attendance. And we've had, we have left 20 minutes for discussion, which I'm very really happy to take now. Both from the room within here, and I stop to share the screen and I also see the online. So for online, either put an exclamation mark in the chat or place your question in the chat. And I'm grateful that at least some of the co-authors are around this area. I see Jakob and Pete, et cetera, thanks, yeah. Uh, please, let's see. Yes. Mm -hmm. May I add a thought here? You know, I think this modeling of what macroeconomically macro happens is a very important thing. But we should not only look at Europe, which, which not even uh, considers the scope free emissions, we really have to look at the world. We have 5 billion people in the world who would like to live with us. So their energy consumption will go up like hell. And now the question is, when these macroeconomics work for Europe, how could they work for these countries as well when the investment goes there? And to see whether this would end in a uh, macroeconomic catastrophic situation, or would it create a boom? Yeah. And when Thanks. we look at yeah. the world, Europe is a small yeah. part of the emissions. So to solve our problem is not, is not really solving yeah. anything. 
three so answers to that. Can you expand yeah. these thoughts yeah. to the world? Because this is where the real thing happens. Yeah. And the macroeconomic effect there is what really counts. Thanks a lot. That's, of course, as climate is a global challenge, that's the only thing that counts at the end. This comes from the European Union uh, project, which, and I see the benefit of analyzing how can Europe go ahead with our energy pathway here. And then these uh, technologies and the systems, it's more a system issue, is available for the rest of the world as well. But there could be, as we have seen here, macroeconomic feedbacks that we wouldn't think of in the first place. We do run global models as well for this second aspect. But the difficulty there is to have it that fine grained on, any, on the energy model. So that's the trade off, basically. And that's why we try to find out um, how it works within Europe and then yeah, take it over the same modeling to, to the global level as well. Because there it's equally crucial as it was here to work from fine grained energy models, and not just top, top down, which, yeah that IEMs and CGs, et cetera, of the world all have. Because what really happens depends. Not maybe, maybe, yeah. Mm -hmm. Please. Um, so my background is uh, spatial econ. So my mm -hmm. question is, can you, and I do that because I believe many things get lost in aggregation. D does your data allow to break it down by socioeconomic distribution of GDP per capita within countries? So you don't just have fairness across countries, but also within, or does the data not allow for that? Um, this particular model is just on a country scale and on a very detailed energy model scale, but we do have other models where we split it down by both by income class, by location of residents, whether it's urban or peripheral or suburban. Yeah, so in principle, the method does, it's always a question of um, and for Europe, this would all be available, available, available basically. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. So there is, uh, we did it mainly for transport so far, these uh, distributional implications for income and uh, location, re location of residence groups, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so, and please tell me if I'm wrong on any point. So uh, I see that result decentralized might be cheaper. Uh, the extending of this partially from, for example, uh, expensive nuclear plants in centralized model versus cheap renewables in the centralized, right? But then does does your model at any points consider that there are more, there's more than just electricity capacity in the end that we need? We also need stability. We need base load energy. We need all those different yeah. things. Yeah. So that's uh, called integration costs. We label it normally. So that that's why I pointed out this combination of generation, transmission, and storage. Basically, that's uh, caring for the stability. And this energy model has a two-hour uh, profile. So we check for every two hours a day for the whole year whether uh, the, the energy is enough, yeah. and especially with electricity. So there's one in the chat. Populations, their agency, contributions, and lives need to grow up into transition and change. I wonder if your model could accommodate some more recent thinking on existentialist behavioral economics, thinking about capabilities of agency and freedom, including people, judging their experience, and meaningful. I wonder whether we would need a more um, agent-based model for that. Well, in the Calliope, I think we could, maybe Jakob, would you have an idea you might know the Calliope better than me? I mean, I think you refer to the very first model, which is called QDDN, which is more of a semi-quantitative model. It's more a narrative or scenario generator. And there, political and social constraints and preferences are taken into account so this is uh this this is part of of the the storyline that we then implement in this model ensemble but of course on a very coarse in a very coarse interpretation uh so in principle it's possible to um reflect on 
agency population on preferences and so on and and carry it over in this small ensemble and root i may answer also by the basic philosophy of this overall horizon 2020 pro project here it is to produce modules that can be put that can be worked run together answering stakeholder questions so we had lots of stakeholder demands what are their demands stakeholder workshops what about their demands and then developed how we link the model what answers we give so we have 100 research questions and so on then try to link by linking those models and thanks Jakob for pointing out that it's mainly this generic generator where it would go in in the first place but then it should show up also in the energy model once we get these results from there okay yes please I'm, I'm curious about the granularity of the CG model. And so maybe one way to ask this question is how do you deal with electrification? So do you have a renewal of the capital stock in specific industries that need to electrify their process? Do you have a renewal of transportation? Yeah. Uh, is it, is yeah. it at that level? Currently, uh, the granularity is only well done in the energy sector itself. And we have not fully reflected that in the investment very detailed in the macro model. The macro model is a national, so it's the national scale, um, but that would be possible, of course. Currently, we just take uh, the energy demands and the, all the other sector demands from the energy model and plug it into the mac macro model. So we, we that the overall investment increases is, of course, in a dynamic CG, it's in there and the overall demand increases, but it's not yet uh, specified. We don't have the very detailed demands for investment by sector yet in, and not the, in this model yet. Yeah. And the energy is energy in general or electricity? Energy in general. And electric, no, the, the energy split up for okay. yeah. Jacob Lindner. Um, yeah, basically all fossil fuels and electricity, heat, and from the energy model, um, other carriers, hydrogen, biofuels, and so on. And while the energy model is a two-hour uh, granularity, we, of course, have just annual averages, but that's okay if, if we re rely on the energy model. Okay. Yes. But then I ask another one, which is, what was what was the reason for the CG failing? Uh, because you started by saying it was giving crazy results before we had the yeah. disaggregated yeah. energy model. Yeah. So what was the reason from substitution? So, mm -hmm. um, a CG basically works on elasticities of sub, 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 substitution, and they are basically calibrated at the margin at the current situation. Mm -hmm. So once um, you go for a complete decarbonization of net zero, um, that's you need an extremely high carbon price to really switch to a different technology, and that's simply um, yeah, it's not, not meaningful, so it's not breaking down. It does give a result, but we have 8,000 euros or so for the economic price. Um, and once you link the uh, bottom-up model, it's come down to reasonable uh, levels again. So I guess this is the main issue of those type, this, this type of macroeconomic model to really link. It's only meaningful for structural breaks to really link it um, to bottom-up models. Initially, relative to econometrics, which works on past experiences of changes, one thought, well, a CG has the strength of being also able to depict stronger changes that have not been experienced in the past. But, but of course, we depend on uh, these technology switches, and they are only in Elasticities of substitution. So either you you raise them, but then this also needs technological people. So in some transport model, what we did to avoid that is calibrate the elasticities of substitution to what people change, and then by price changes we 
knew what, uh, so we had a network model and, and different prices for tram transport. And, and then we said, well, work trip and leisure trip, et cetera. How much do people change? And then we changed, we calibrated the elasticity of substitution in the CG model to reflect what we knew from the behavioral model. Oh, yeah, this is an answer to Luke's question also. So we could reflect this behavioral uh, different assumptions in calibrating our elasticity of substitution to these either observed or assumed behavioral change. Because changes. otherwise you, you pick them up from where the elasticity is. Is there a great database people are using or? Um, actually it's uh, not that manifold. There is a few, well, it's, it's a large database. Yes, there's a few publications that are mainly used. And the issue there is, um, they are usually done for a very specific production function. So you should only use it for the same, for the same nesting, etc. So, yeah, that's, and you can't really uh, address it all by sense and sensitivity analysis because it's so core. Yeah. So I would say for close by changes, yes, but for this large change chain changes, you need to make sure to, so we, use, use, you, you, we usually do it then by the only production functions for that area we really are interested in and implement that exogenously in steel, in cement, how they switch to different te technologies and, and, and force them to, to do so and don't do that by price. But get, of course, the feedback effects uh, from the model itself, uh, what such a switch would induce in terms of sectoral shifts and foreign trade and leakage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so um, just out of curiosity, because we're aiming for net zero, not absolute zero, and we expect that 2050 to be uh, carbon reduction technologies, like with some estimation of cost. Yeah. Do, you, do you use that? In the Calliope model, there is air reduction, direct air reduction. Um, um, yeah, so, so that's in, right. Um, I'm now, that's the only emission reduction. So it's not back, so I think it's just direct air reduction, Jakob. Direct air capturing. Yes, direct air cap capturing. Yeah. But of course, one might also, I don't know, is specs just too expensive and therefore not used? So yeah, I think, I think that. Would be no, not yet, definitely. But, uh, no, I mean, in, in the model, it's okay. not yeah, it's not activated. But that's an issue we're discussing with Miles Allen actually the other day here, whether we should, yeah, in what direction, what feedbacks that would have. And then we're on a global level again, what feedbacks that would have on global production shifts, uh, what are the competitiveness of competitive advantages and disadvantages of Europe over the rest of the world. Okay. Well, thanks a lot for the rich set of questions, both. Other more questions from uh, the virtual room. Yeah, if not, then I wish all of you a very fine afternoon and that we all may together experience this net zero pathway. And then we'll see which path, which of the pathways you choose. And it might be, yeah, some elements here, but there's probably a lot of other elements as well relevant for policy. All the best uh, here in Oxford. Yeah, and if you want to discuss further, I'm around for the whole month of May here at INET. So just come by and look, looking forward for a coffee and discuss any further issues you might come up with at some other point. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for, Thanks for sharing. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> 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 <laughs>